Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about Turbo Generator. So let's dive right into it. So what exactly is this Turbo Generator? Well, unfortunately, the definition is not quite clear, but in rough uh, sense, it's big and powerful AC generator. That's it. Nothing more than that. Now, what the core component is, is direct drive. I have no idea what the heck I wrote here. Uh, Basically, there is no gearbox between the primary mover and the generator, meaning many times you could have primary movers that have very high RPM or very low RPM. For example, in case of uh, wind turbines, the RPM could be very low for, of the prime mover. So you'll have a gearbox that will increase the RPM and then drive the puppy. Here, you do not do that. You uh, direct drive this puppy, meaning if your steam turbine is rotating at, let's say, ludicrous speed of 3600 RPM, you'll just direct drive that puppy. That's it. It's direct driven. Even if you have RPM of 1500, you direct drive that. That's turbo generator. Generally, high RPM puppies. And uh, what are the two primary components that provide that high RPM? One is jet engine. There are many natural gas jet engine power plants and uh, steam turbine, which are the primary mover of the, well, majority of the planet's energy. So it could be powered by coal, it could be powered by nuclear, it could be powered by natural gas, whatever have you. So steam turbines are generally the main culprit here. So to give you a context of RPM and frequency that we are talking about, 50 Hertz, uh, basically majority of the world, it requires 1500 RPM for four pole generator, uh, requires 3000 RPM for two pole generator. Now here's the deal. RPM has uh, pros and cons. For example, the consequence of higher RPM is like higher wear, meaning if you take the best bearing manufacturer, and figure out the best, the most amazing bearing out there and you ask them how long this bearing will run on 1500 RPM, the answer would be let's say 10 years. Now same bearing, the most, the best, the most amazing system, you ask them for 3000 RPM, the life will go down and sometimes it will go down dramatically. Uh, that's why diesel engines can run much longer than compared to petrol engines. So higher the RPM, higher the wear and tear. Now then my question becomes why the heck anybody would want to design something that runs at higher RPM? Well, RPM is another vector. For example, in AC systems, you have voltage, you have amps, but you also have a third component, which is frequency. Meaning, if you cannot increase the voltage too much, you cannot increase the amps too much, you can increase the frequency, meaning the RPM. So in this sort of scenario, again, pole gives you another in vector of control. So if let's say, for example, the manufacturer said, hey, the biggest turbine we can make and ship to you, it would be uh, limited to 10 meter in diameter. Let's have figure out the best situation of transportation. It's like, dude, we cannot exceed 10 meter diameter. Okay, that's it. Here's you. What if that's not enough for you? What if you have 10 meter diameter and running at 1500 RPM and everything is awesome, but you're like, dude, we need a bit more oomph out of it. You have the coal to burn for it, but how do you get more? You can't transport more turbines there. Again, there are some limitations of that. You cannot make the turbine bigger. Transportation simply will not be possible. So what can you do? You can increase the RPM. So that's why many times to get more oomph out of small package, you can increase the RPM to go into two pole system. Or if you are in a scenario where you have very low RPMs, you can increase the pole. <coughs> pole count while still getting 50 hertz. 60 hertz will have 1800 for four pole, 3600 for two poles. Now in aircraft industry, jet engines are uh, generally driving a turbo generator, which is providing the main power of the aircraft. Now they run on a bit higher RPMs. <coughs> because I'm reasonably sure you can understand jet engines RPM is like 3000 is like, bro, I don't go low enough for that. Uh, so <clears throat> they generally run at 400 hertz to manage that. So that's the whole aspect of turbo generator. Anything that is directly shaft coupled, generally big boys, and generally they're running at very high RPM. Basically backbone of the majority of power production of this planet. So how do we put power into this? Well, we <clears throat> because these are what we call synchronous generator, they require electromagnet at the core. Now, can we replace that electromagnet with permanent magnet? Yes, but if you do that, you lose the control of voltage, meaning the voltage is no longer in your control. Whether you want fine-tuned control of the voltage, forget it, permanent magnet is fixed. So you have to put electromagnet and because it's synchronous, meaning the RPM will directly translate to frequency. There will not be any sloppiness that you will get in induction motor and generator units. So electro, uh, synchronous gives you the frequency lock, electromagnet gives you the control factor. So that allows the voltage control, meaning if somebody puts load on the grid and voltage starts to sag, you're like, okay, vol uh, voltage control unit will boost the power that is going into the rotor. So generally rotor requires DC, positive and negative, and you have the choice of using brush, slip rings, basically positive and negative, or you can use uh, basically another 
you will have a DC coil on the outside that is creating the magnetic field north and south pole and there this because it's spinning from something else like steam uh, it will basically act like a generator this puppy will produce AC power small amount of AC power that AC power will go into what we call spinning diodes that diode will make it into DC that DC will feed into the main rotor and provide the power this is what we call brushless system uh, benefit of the system it does have some less wear and tear that's up to you so and here you will control the primary uh, basically DC coils that will give you the power there is no physical contact here you have physical contact so that's our that's how you just get the generator starting because without if, if you're not injecting power into it it's just spinning it's not self-starting you have to feed power into the exciter then we come to the rotor the main rotating element now this requires hydrogen for cooling because these generators they started very small they were like very gentle puppy of one megawatt now we have generators even in india that is 800 megawatt let that sink in a single unit generator. i'm not talking power plant i'm talking single generator that is 800 mega and there are some designs that are around 200 basically they exceed one gigawatt rating let that sink in single generator that is that powerful so they need hydrogen for cooling why well when you're talking about something this big you can understand you cannot have like 220 volt here amps will become stupid so they try to make the voltage as high as possible but there is a limit to that you cannot just have the voltage go yolo so voltage limitations are generally around under 30 kV yes these puppies are one running on kV scale so they have corona discharge now oxygen plus corona discharge not a good combination but if you evacuate this puppy basically the generator chamber evacuate that puppy flush that puppy with hydrogen you reduce the thermal uh, basically coronal discharge to such a point where the lifespan of the dielectric strength is much higher lifespan all the coating everything that you are doing that is insulating this puppy will last exponentially longer so that's good second hydrogen is very light element meaning it has very high thermal conductivity meaning if you have a hot component cold component hydrogen is going to bounce very quickly here and there if it's a heavy element like for example uh, not even element let's say nitrogen it's not going to bounce very quickly so fundamentally you want something that has high thermal conductivity meaning it can conduct from a to b very efficiently hydrogen is your guy then we come to how much oomph it can take itself before its temperature goes up water is the best uh, this puppy is really good in terms of gaseous state uh, specific heat meaning how much joules it's going to absorb before one kg of it will gain you know one degree celsius is genuinely good like really really good then we come to the final amazing aspect is low density meaning this puppy is spinning and it couldn't be spinning as high rpm as like 3600 rpm in those sort of scenario drag becomes a big issue spinning this puppy is spinning fast drag is an issue drag means lost energy so how do you reduce drag you put low density there meaning even if you pressurize hydrogen by a lot it will not have the same drag coefficient if it was done with carbon dioxide nitrogen or things like that because hydrogen itself h2 itself is very tiny so that's why we use hydrogen now be mindful it does require pure hydrogen you cannot have contamination but unfortunately you cannot buy pure hydrogen there is no such thing as pure hydrogen this hydrogen tank contains only hydrogen that does not exist what you'll have 99.999 now here's the another aspect of all these good components is that hydrogen escapes like there is no seal that can be created by the man that can stop hydrogen it's gonna leak now of course if you do your job properly it will leak very slowly but it will leak now consequence of that is that you feed in hydrogen from 99.9 percent .9 efficiency like uh, purity you put it into the generator generator was spinning one month goes by enough hydrogen has leaked by the percentage of uh, contamination per unit has gone up meaning your purity went down over time it will go down to such a level where it's unsafe the generator is unsafe so it requires periodic purging meaning you will open the vent to the atmosphere and let all the hydrogen go now because the vent will be much larger opening compared to the seal leak uh, the hydrogen can go away with impurities at that point in time you'll flush fresh hydrogen which is 99.99 percent efficiency as purity and then voila your hydrogen system is now pure flushed and it's going to keep working this is done continuously automatically all the time 24 into 7 anytime generator detects the purity is not high enough it will stop the generator so again generally there will be a lot of alarms before that happens but if let's say nobody rectifies the situation the generator will be shut down uh, does it cause boom well yes it does sometimes uh, generally it's very um, rare that you're gonna have boom because of the hydrogen because be mindful while you are talking about hydrogen there is not enough inside here it's 100 percent hydrogen so like again as close to 100 there's not and there is nothing to burn there is not enough oxygen to burn that so it's safe what about the outside of the chamber again let's say little amount of is leaking as long as you have below four percent concentration it's not used it's not gonna do anything so 
is safe for outside also and again when venting is done there are uh, procedures in place to make sure that it does not cause any accidental boom so that's how we take care of the rotor and that's why always all the turbo generators will have these fans now again you may find a generator that is air cooled but again it will be much lower power turbo generator that are very high power generally has to use hydrogen so these fans that you notice on all the ends uh, pro, uh, you know front end and the back end is the fan that is circulating the hydrogen so that's how rotors are kept calm because be mindful the energy that is going into the rotor is idiotically high like thousands of amp like so many amps that is not measured in amps it's measured in kilo amps then we come to the stator the main baby that is making the well money uh, making making the power three phase power now currents in this sort of stators could go stupid meaning uh, you can easily cross 20000 amps meaning you will never find a nameplate that says 20000 amps it's like it's, the number is too huge so it's like 20 kilo amp and there are generators that exceed that also so let that sink in like that, that amount of amp is so much that you touch two metal it will weld instantaneously like you will not need welding it's like shh welded done so that amp is stupid high. How do you cool something that high? Because here's the deal, even if it's 99% efficient, that 1% remaining is more than enough to melt anything. So how do you do that? You use water. Now why water? Again, water has the most amazing heat capacity. It bits slabs oil. So it is really good at that. Consequence, it's not as strong in terms of dielectric. So it does require what we call 100% demineralized water, meaning absolute purity. Now, we have purity of water like which we send into uh, basically uh, our battery, it requires distilled water. That's nothing, that's dirty water for uh, this sort of application. It has a whole subsystem, basically uh, stator cooling system, whole system with filters, RO systems, more filters, more ion exchangers, more everything, more redundancy and all its job is like to keep filtering the water continuously and I will like okay it's a closed loop system why the heck it needs continuous uh, you know uh, filtering well because these bars are pure copper meaning pure copper is reactive to uh, you know uh, water and you have heat meaning you have something that agitates thing heat you have something that reacts to universal solvent water and then you have copper which is a metal which corrodes so fundamentally it's always eroding again it will take a very long time before it destroys the uh, stator as in like very 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 long time but water has to be filtered very quickly because the moment this puppy detects uh, contaminated water it will shut down the generator emergency shutdown it also has that authority like same way hydrogen system has authority this also has authority again both of the system will give you plenty of warning before it's like bro we are at serious levels please take care of the situation or i have to shut it down shut it down so it has to be continuously monitored and filtered so what does it mean at all? Well, at the end of the day, it's all about balance because you can buy systems that are not as complicated as these things and still qualify as turbo generator, which could be air cooled, not hydrogen cooled. But your generator size will go up. For example, uh, they are generally preferred for small units. Why? Well, you want mass in your generator. Why? Because that's how the grid is stabilized. You do not want a light generator. You do not want that. You want a turbine to be big and heavy, spinning part as big and heavy as possible. You want the generator rotor as big and heavy as possible. Why? Well, think of it this way. How the heck our grid is stable? Like how the heck you can turn on a TV? How the heck any industrial power plant can turn on at all, which can have like 10 megawatt of draw? It does not collapse the grid instantaneously. How the heck that happens? Because they are not making a phone call. It's like, bro, we're going to turn on the system. So somebody in power plant is like, okay, increasing the power output by 10 megawatt. How the heck that happens? Inertia, physics. So what's the physics here? Physics is here, let's say you put a load, let's say a giant ma motor that is draining 10 megawatt. Where the 10 megawatt of energy comes from? It comes from the transfer, nearest transformer, it saps power from there. That transformer saps power from the high voltage transmission. That high voltage transmission uh, saps power from the substation that is boosting the power. Okay, that energy is sapped here. Transformer couples it magnetically to this generator. Now what happens to this generator? The stator dumps that magnetic uh, drain onto the rotor. Rotor starts to slow down. Because this is so big and heavy, and be mindful, this puppy alone is more than good enough, you also have spinning turbines. So grand total inertia, and given the RPM, uh, you know, stupidity of 3000 RPM, it has enough oomph, so it can take its time. What does that do? That simply means computer can look at it and be like, huh, my RPM is going down from 3000, it's supposed to be, to 2999. Yeah, that's that's bad. It will wait, it will like 2998. Okay, increase the steam pressure. So the frequency never drifts uh, beyond that. And again, that RPM I'm exaggerating because generally it would be even lower than that. 
it will be like you know point point little bit and again it happens in reverse also meaning somebody turns off the drain let's say there was a cricket stadium that was draining power like there is no tomorrow and uh, you know game ends so everybody shuts off their you know lights and all that power drain the rpm starts to go up but again because of the inertia it will not just it will take its time now that time is enough for a computer to detect it's like bro steam chill that's how our rpm and frequency is stabilized and again i'm not talking about like one general think of it this way this is happening throughout the grid everything that is connected through the grid is uh, coupling with the sort of inertia that's why we have stable grid so you do not want to make tiny generators you want big generators as long as you can transfer it transport it that's a limitation you cannot make okay i want to make a generator that is size of a container ship that would be awesome but problem would be like how the heck you going to transport it so Size is something that is uh, desirable here, but power density is something even more desirable. So at that point in time, you're like, hey, bro, I'm, my power plant is small, let's say 10 megawatt. There's no point of uh, putting hydrogen because again, if you did that, it will make your generator too small. That may not be uh, enough inertia for you. Where like, you know, I think we need a bit more oomph, bit more inertia. So they will be like, let's go for air cooling. Again, it will simplify your cost. Operational uptime will also go up. Then same goes for brush, uh, brushless design, meaning if you are in a place where like uptime is the biggest thing, it's like, dude, I can deal with a little bit of inefficient, but I want uptime, meaning this puppy does not go down. You will go with brushless system because it has less maintenance. There is not like an actual metal thing grinding against carbon brushes. That's not happening. So fundamentally, it does last uh, maintenance cycle between two downtimes is much larger. So many times people are like, dude, shut up and take my money with brushless exciter. So again, these are the core basis of, well, our entirety of grid, spin mass stabilization. If we do not have like this giant generator, we'll not have this giant electrical infrastructure. It has to be huge. And that's another problem that people are facing now because wind turbine does not have this. Uh, solar definitely does not have this. Hydro does have that, but not to the same extent this puppy. Like these puppies are the main backbone. So even if in future we may have a scenario where we can solarize everything, we have to figure out how to add spin mass stabilization. Because if we do not have these, our grid is poof. There are people working on solid state system, but uh, physics tells us that nothing will beat good old mass so that's the balance aspect you have to balance all the uh, variables i can see in the future somebody figuring out like how to make stator into a uh, superconductor because again this is not adding anything to it so it can be made lighter if somebody can make it light enough where it can be easily transported that would be desirable if we can improve efficiency even by let's say 0.5 percent when you're talking about something that is gigawatt in scale that is enough uh, to justify it. So that could happen. Rotor, not likely. Because people will be like, do we lose spin mass inertia? Because be mindful, more and more solar is added. That does not have spin mass inertia. So <laughs> these things are like trying to stabilize much more than they are designed to. So there is always a balance. You always have to be Thanos about it. So this was my presentation on turbo generators. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.